Today we are talking about the Easter Cantata by German composer Ernst Wilhelm Wolf. Wolf was not a Moravian, um, but um, the Moravians knew and loved a lot of his music. Um, let me tell you a little bit about him first. Um, he was born in Grossenbering in Germany. It's a really small town close to the center of Germany. It's northeast of Frankfurt and west of Leipzig. Um, he studied in Eisenach and Gotha and entered the University of Jena in 1755, where he was made director of the Collegium Musicum. Now, in this, he followed in the footsteps of Johann Nikolaus Bach, a cousin of Johann Sebastian Bach, who was director of the Collegium Musicum at the University of Jena. But the other thing is that we need to note that a lot of Moravians attended this university in the middle of the 18th century, including people like uh, Philip Heinrich Molther, Ludolf Ernst Schlicht, and Johann Michael Graf. I know these are people that you know and love. Oh, yeah. Because, right? <laughs> but they, their, na their names are not terribly familiar to the Moravians in the pew, but they were all leaders in the mid-century Moravian church. Molther was a tutor in Zinzendorf's fam household. Schlicht wrote the words to What Brought Us Together and Ye Who Called, those two hymns. Johann Michael Graf served in Wachovia here for 20 years, starting in 1762. He was our first resident bishop here. We should remember that when he came to Bethabara in 1762, he's the one who brought with him the first pipe organ to Wachovia. We don't know that these Moravians actually participated in the Collegium Musicum in Jena, but we know they were all musically inclined. They were all hymn writers. They all composed some music. What do you think the chances are? I bet they were involved. So Wolf is likely to have known some Moravians there at the University of Jena. Well, he moved to Leipzig in 1758. Um, served in Naumburg as a music teacher for a while before he became the music tutor to the sons of the Duchess Anna Amelia in Weimar uh, and stayed there for the rest of his life. I wish we had time to explore that because that whole Weimar musical culture and who was in the court of the Duchess Anna Amelia is just fascinating. It's a who's who of mid-18th century musical culture. Well, his works got known far beyond Weimar during his lifetime. His opera operatic compositions include some folk elements and popular songs, and some are fairly simplistic, but others are, are known to be quite lovely. He wrote over 30 motets, passions, cantatas, and choruses for the church. They show influence of Graun and C.P.E. Bach. By the later 18th century, though, his style of composition was considered to be old-fashioned. He wasn't a Moravian at any time during his life, but a number of his anthems, along with his Easter cantata, survive in Moravian collections in various locations around the world. And we, prior to working on the Easter cantata, had already published two of his anthems in our anthem series. The Easter cantata survives here in our uh, collections in a set of parts copied by Moravian composer Johannes Herbst and a full score that belonged to Herbst that was published in 1781, I believe, 1782. Um, so here is the publication. And the way we know it belonged to Herbst is that he was good enough to sign it. <laughs> so, and it looks like that, just a great big score. And Brother Herbst also wrote the instrument name down the uh, side uh, margin. This may have been his source for copying the set of parts that he made. Except there's one interesting piece of that. By the way, we're really glad he copied the set of parts because this score is missing the conclusion of the last movement. So <laughs> we're really glad to have had the parts. But the parts, which are just like everything else Brother Herbst wrote, gorgeous and clean and without errors and without ink blots or anything like that, the parts contain a movement that the score does not. Hmm. The libretto, the text for this thing, was put together by uh, Johann Herder, Johann Gottfried Herder, who um, was a pastor and literary critic and a friend of Goethe. 
And because of Goethe's influence with, guess who, Duchess Anna Amelia, um, Herder was in Weimar during the same years that Wolf was. Well, Herder's libretto for the Easter cantata contains the words for that movement that's, that Herop's number is number six, but it's not in the published score. And other copies of that movement exist, not attributed to Wolf, but attributed to Johann Gottlieb Naumann, another composer who worked in Dresden a great many years and whom the Moravians knew and loved. And he wrote some music for the Moravians in Herrenhut. So there's a mystery here. We don't know, we don't know how Herbst got a hold of that movement. It wasn't in the publication. We don't know the source he copied it from yet. Someday, maybe we will. But it's gorgeous, and I'm going to let you hear a little bit of it. Well, the cantata starts. I'm going to talk through the structure of the whole thing and just play you little snippets of some of the movements. We just don't have time because the whole thing is like 45 or 50 minutes. It's worth hearing. It's beautiful. It received, to our knowledge, its first modern performance this last summer at the Moravian Music Festival in Bethlehem. <coughs> What happened, how we got from this to that, though, is a two or three year study, story of research. David Bloom, who is a Moravian living in Columbus, Ohio, he's a professional research librarian for a biochemical company, <laughs> uh, fabulous musician, has a Master of Arts in um, church music now, uh, <clears throat> and a terrific music editor. He got copies, I sent him copies of the manuscript both the parts and the score, and over two and a half years' time, he put them into the computer. And some of the research I'm presenting here is actually his, um, uh, his notes about the origin of the work and all of this. So uh, David is very, very much to be thanked for all that work that he did. Then he sent them to me. I proofread against the manuscripts. We went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And when we were content that what was on the printed page was actually what was in these parts. Then we sent it to Gwen Michael in Bethlehem, and she and I went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth to make, them, to make the printed parts, our new parts, pretty and ready for publication. We have published all four of the choruses from the cantata. Uh, we have not published the whole thing yet. Well, the cantata as a whole begins with a really sad sounding opening, very meditative, minor key, but with the words, the Lord of life have they put to death, the Savior of Israel, they captured him and slaughtered him. The blameless goes to death, and there is none whose heart is moved to pity. Yeah, that ought to be set in a slow and meditative and minor key. But this is, remember, this is an Easter cantata. This isn't, isn't a passion cantata. He's not going to stay there very long. The character of the movement changes with the words, but your dead will live again and rise anew. And then the first of many sort of botanical or references or references to nature where the text translates, awake and bloom, you sleeping ones under the earth. Your dew is the spring of life. The other piece of this puzzle that I didn't mention when I was talking about how we got there was the translation of the text. Daniel Cruz and I worked on this over many months' time, and we would look at the German and say, you have got to be kidding. <laughs> he really said that? Bloom, are you sleeping ones under the earth? Yep, he did. <laughs> and this is but movement one. <laughs> well, following this first movement, but I just don't have time to play it all, is a recitative describing the passage of Jesus through death, through hell, and back into life, and a rousing chorus to greet the risen Lord. Fling wide the portals, the gates of the world. Let me play a little bit of that. <laughs> Yeah. 
for another couple of minutes. Now here's the intriguing part and why I really wanted you to hear that movement. This is one of several movements of this Easter cantata that found its way into the musical repertoire of the Moravians in Labrador. It was translated and is still used at the Easter Sunday 10 a.m. service, still. It also found its way to the Moravians in South Africa. One of our Moravian brothers who was at the 2003 festival brought me the first page and said, we don't know who wrote this, what is it? And of course it wasn't in a language I knew, but I went looking and found out this is what it was. By the way, of the seven or eight known surviving copies of this Easter cantata, the manuscript in the world, I think six of the eight came through Moravian hands. We're the ones who loved it and kept it. And when it went old fashioned, that didn't bother us. Yeah. <laughs> so by the way, the, the performance practice in Labrador uh, is considerably slower, very, very slow. So we probably wouldn't recognize it and they probably wouldn't recognize this. <laughs> well anyway, following this jubilant celebration, uh, by the way the text again is the same as the same German source for the hymn Lift Up Your Heads Ye Mighty Gates. Um, yes, it's the same German source. Um, following that is a chorale for the congregation to sing like so many cantatas of the day. Um, very straightforward, uh, conventional harmonies, rejoicing in that Jesus has overcome death and that he's risen. And then a recitative for two tenors. Starts with some more references to nature. Listen to this translation. As the once far departed beloved son sighs and longs for spring's return, and as in cool of night its weary eye is weeping when rosy dawn already breaks the mournful fog and tears the veil and becomes light. Thus Mary weeps, and as she weeps forlorn, close beside her Jesus stands and names her. Well, that's tenor one. Tenor two jumps in to tell the story of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Then tenor one comes back with the story of Jesus appearing to the disciples in the locked upper room. Tenor two jumps back in telling the story of Jesus' appearance to Thomas and Thomas' response, now I have found you my Lord and my God. And then tenor one closes the conversation with Jesus on the shore asking Peter, do you love me? And Peter's response, all knowing one, look on my heart, I love you. So what we have for that movement is two tenors telling the story of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances back and forth. And did you hear what happened here? And what about what happened here? And what about over here? Uh, and this one, and this one, and this one, they sort of pile on top of each other. So it's a wonderfully creative way to, to tell those, all those different stories. You get the little snippet here, and then the little one here, and then the little one back and forth like that. Um, the next movement is the number six that we that I mentioned that appears not to have been written by Wolf, but rather by Naumann. Um, and you know, I don't know how it got to Herbst. Interesting. This was published, I mentioned, in 1782. Remember that Herbst didn't leave Europe to come to America until 1785. So, and he had been copying music for many years by the time he came over here. Uh, his copying is just an amazing thing. So anyway, follow, let's listen to a little bit of that. You need to listen to a little bit of the, of the, um, the quartet that we don't know where it came from. Thank you. 
hard to turn these off. They're just so pretty. <laughs> well, following this quartet, which is about a five-minute piece by itself, um, is an extended aria, another five or six minutes, an aria comparing life breaking forth from death to the way the lovely morning dawns from darkest night. Again, more nature references. Uh, then another choral movement with the text from the Song of Hannah in the second chapter of First Samuel. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. Isn't that odd? That's one that we had to figure out, what are we going to do with this? It's a lovely choral movement, but how are we going to publish this? Because it's not a text that many choirs would sing. Not sure that they should. So um, what we, but within the, within the context of the whole cantata, it makes sense, reminding us that God is indeed the sovereign of all, life and death. That there isn't anything that's beyond God's power. Uh, so what we did when we published this as a separate piece is we include the German original, we include the literal translation, and then we included a different text, a sort of a, um, adaptation of the verse from uh, the first chapter of Revelation, uh, where in that first chapter of Revelation where Jesus said, I'm the one who died and lives again. So what we did was, he who died, behold, now he is living. So it becomes an Easter anthem indeed. Uh, so it's just, we've got both texts in there, so that the one that you would use if you were doing the whole Easter cantata within its context, and the other as a separate piece. Um, then, then a chorale where the congregation members sing, God's right hand is ever near me, though it lies beyond my sight. Always there in darkest valley is my Savior and his light. Even there is God beside me, there his blessed face will guide me. In my troubled hour most grim, I with hope will look to him. So that makes sense as a congregation's response to God sends death and God raises to new life. God's right hand is ever with me. Even in my troubled hour most grim, I with hope will look to him. It makes sense then within the context of the whole thing. The conclusion of the entire Easter cantata is an extended three-part movement. Actually, it really is three movements strung together so that you just go straight from one to the other. Uh, first is a recitative um, sung in this performance by tenor Glenn Siebert. Um, and at the end of the recitative, the orchestra is beginning to play the opening line of the chorale that follows, the chorale that band members today know as 83D. Uh, Jesus, my Redeemer, lives. Bum, 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 bum. Which, incidentally, that's what the, is the response to the recitative as a congregational hymn with those words. Jesus, my Redeemer, lives. I, too, unto life shall waken. He will have me where he is unto heaven's beauties taken. Weakness, suffering in that day ever shall be done away. And that goes directly into the final chorus, O oh, death now is swallowed in victory. A couple of interesting things, though, about that chorus. It starts with a trio of solo sopranos singing hallelujah, accompanied by high strings. It's, it's ethereal sounding. I can, I can imagine them singing off stage somewhere. Um, and the strings have little motives from the chorale that you just heard, that you just sang, Jesus my Redeemer lives. Then the chorus kicks in one part after another, rejoicing in Christ's victory over death. The choir splits into two halves, singing antiphonally to each other, death, where is your sting? Grave, your victory? And it's like, it's like they're scoffing, the Christian is really scoffing at death, which thought to hold us captive, and instead death itself has been swallowed up in Christ's victory. Then after we go back and forth with that a little bit, then there's a fugue of praise to God, and finally it ends with the three sopranos singing hallelujah. It's fairly long, um, so it, it's like a, this is like a 10 minute movement, but I would love for you to hear it. If you need to leave, I won't have my feelings hurt. But I do want you to hear this whole, this whole last movement, so 
beginning with the recitative, then moving through the chorale, then, then uh, the chorus.
not just a marvelous way to finish an Easter cantata. It's just like we're floating up to heaven. So that's why I wanted you to hear the whole thing because the whole movement is as raucous as you expect uh, the end of an Easter cantata to be. And I think that drift up to heaven is absolutely brilliant writing. Um, it's very deeply moving to hear. So. How many weeks of rehearsal were necessary to prepare that? Four days. This was done at the Moravian Music Festival this summer. They saw it for the first time Monday morning. And actually not even that long because you saw it Monday morning and performed it Wednesday night. Now, what they had, we mailed the music to the participants ahead of time, and I had generated audio files off of the music software that would give you an idea of sort of what it would sound like, mechanical sounding, but at least you could, you could begin to get it in your ear off the audio files on the computer. But they, they had three days to pull that together. John Sinclair is thinking to do a professional recording of that possibly this fall, um, so, which would, would be wonderful. He'll do it with a smaller group, and the closing fugue will probably be a good bit faster. Uh, all praise to God, the victory he has given. That's like that. It'd probably just move along a little more. Who is the composer of the, of the chorale? Oh, shucks, John. I don't remember off the top of my head. It was, it was one that was around a whole lot. Uh, uh, is it 83D? In, it's 83D, yeah. And it's been around, it was around in Germany a whole lot during those years. So um, Wolf just adapted it. He brought it in, set Herder's text to it, and did his own harmonization. So it's a slightly different harmonization than's in our hymnal. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. mm-hmm. Isn't it? Isn't it? So when we, when we published the, chor the, the, the choral movements, um, for that one, we published the chorale and the chorus. So it actually begins with the, with the chorale and then moves into the, the final chorus. So, well, it's uh, part of the music festival CDs, and I've got to check and see just how, how much can we make it available. Um, because it, it just was written, it was done for the uh, participants in the festival to have. But we'll, we'll find out, Fran. Um, next month, Moravian Lower Brass. Now, why did I move that from this month? I moved that from this month. It was supposed to be this month. I moved that from this month because this weekend, starting tomorrow night, the Low Brass is recording Lent and Easter tunes. If I put it off till next month, I can play you snippets of the recording that will be out by Easter this year. So come back next month to hear the Moravian Low Brass and a preview of the next recording to come out. I thought I had misread the schedule. No, the schedule was the schedule was right. We made a we made a swap so we could so you could hear us hear the low brass recording next no, month. One more yes. question. And uh -huh. you may you may have addressed this and I missed uh -huh. it. Um, are there records of early performances? Not that I know of. No. no, we have we have found next to no records of exactly what was performed here, other than some Sundays. We know special festival Sundays. Uh, in Nazareth, Pennsylvania, they uh, they kept a record of concerts that were done, and that record stand, spans something like thirty years. Um, I don't think the Wolf was done in its entirety there, but we don't have a corresponding record of concerts here. I wish we did. I wish we did. Maybe it's going to turn up in somebody's attic or basement or organ chamber. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. See you next month. <laughs>